Good morning. Oh, holy cow, there's people out there. If it's all right with you, I'm going to sit part of the time, okay? Now, we've already got a problem. I entered a room and you all didn't stand up. You're supposed to rise when a judge enters a room. <laughs> We're going to do it different. I'm going to sit, okay? Welcome. I want to take you back. How many of you would love it if you had a time machine? Yeah, way cool. I'm going to take you back to 1999, 20 years ago. My youngest son was getting ready for his senior year in high school. He was on the volleyball team and he was on the golf team at his high school in Florida. His sophomore year, they won the state championship in golf. His junior year, they won the state championship in men's volleyball. And he was really looking forward to his senior year, and so was his daddy. You know why his daddy was? He started getting letters from colleges <laughs> saying, we're going to pay you to come play golf at our college. I kind of like that idea. And I walked into his bedroom, putting away the socks in his sock drawer. Son, get in here. What the hell is this? I know what it is. You don't have to tell me. It's marijuana, isn't it? Yeah, Dad. It's marijuana. You dumb idiot, you're going to ruin your chance for a scholarship. They're not going to ask you to play golf at their school or play volleyball at their school if you're using dope. That stuff's addictive. You're grounded for a month. Dad, all I can tell you is that when I smoke it, my stomach doesn't hurt anymore. You see, my son had irritable bowel syndrome and colitis. I said to him, you lying sack of poop. You're grounded for a year. You're lying to me. I grounded him for a year. No car, no parties. Golf team was undefeated won the state championship again. He couldn't party or celebrate. Volleyball team was undefeated. He was named all state in volleyball. But his father, because I was stupid and didn't know the truth, ruined his senior year. Folks, you and I have got a big job to do. We have to educate people. I grew up in the early 60s. I graduated from high school in 19... <laughs> long time ago. My best friend got drafted and went to Vietnam. I was in a rock and roll band in the 60s called Rick and the Romans. If you're in my age category, yep. Rick and the Romans, yep, we played wearing togas. Rick was killed in Vietnam. My best friend Ronnie came back from Vietnam addicted to heroin. Started using marijuana in Vietnam to deal with the pain and the fear stepped up to heroin, was in prison. So you can guess what my attitude was about marijuana, grass, ganja, reefer. I went to college, got out of college, became a football coach and a track coach at a high school in Ohio. Wouldn't let none of them kids touch that reefer. It's evil. 
Couldn't make much money coaching football at a high school, so I went to law school. Became a judge. Was a juvenile court judge for two years in Dayton, Ohio. Then was a municipal court judge for six years in Dayton, Ohio. Municipal court is a city court. Uh, we had jurisdiction over misdemeanors. And at that time in the early 80s, we had mandatory sentencing for marijuana possession and trafficking. I had no choice as a judge. I came out here to Nevada to Judicial College where they burned some marijuana so we could see what it smelled like. And we were given education and training about how it's a gateway drug and teenagers are stepping up from marijuana and going to cocaine and heroin and crack. I put 311 people in prison, in jail, for marijuana offenses. 17 of them for a year. That's where I came from. Let me take you back even farther than 1999. Let's go back to 1937. Randolph Hearst owned 28 newspapers around the country. Multi-millionaire. DuPont was developing what was to be the miracle fiber. Nylon. Andrew Mellon was another millionaire in that time. Oil and gas millionaire. In the late 30s, a guy named uh, Henry Ford built a car, 82% hemp. Guess what it ran on? Hemp oil. Cannabis. Whoa. Holy crap, you guys. We can't let this happen. If we keep hemp and cannabis lawful, we'll lose our millions. DuPont, his miracle fiber, nylon, which comes from petroleum product, which takes 100 to 200 years to develop in the ground. Hemp, on the other hand, goes from seed to harvest in four months. Whoa! And hemp fiber is 10 times stronger than nylon and one-tenth the cost. We got to stop this. Andrew Mellon said, yeah, if cars can run on hemp oil, I'm going to lose my millions. And then there was Randolph Hearst, owner of 28 newspapers across this country. Randolph Hearst owned 8 million acres of what I call paper pines, pine tree forests that were used to make the pulp that makes paper for his newspapers. Well, back around 1920, there was a bandit by the name of Pancho Villa. How many of you remember that name in history? Pancho Villa was a Mexican, and he made a terrible, terrible mistake. He burned down about 300,000 acres of Randolph Hearst timber pines. Pardon my expression, but that pissed him off. So he hated Mexicans. So these millionaires got together about the mid-30s and said, we have got to stop hemp. Hemp and cannabis. Cannabis and hemp. Well, also in the 30s, they were ending prohibition. About 12,000 Revenue agents were going to be out of a job. One of those agents, who for a while worked with Elliot Ness, if you remember that name from The Untouchables, a guy named Harry Onslinger. How many have heard that name, Harry Onslinger? Harry Onslinger was a devil himself. 
He was a revenue agent, but he happened to be engaged to the niece of Andrew Mellon. So these millionaires got together. We know what we can do. We're going to make hemp and cannabis unlawful. And we're going to turn revenue agents into narcotics agents. And Harry, we're going to make you the director. So they bribed members of Congress. Harry Onslinger started getting articles published in Randolph Hearst's 28 newspapers across the country to turn of the American people against cannabis. Until 1937, cannabis was a medicine used by 100% of every man, woman, and child in this country. Over 50% of all medicines produced by pharmaceutical companies contained cannabis. But it was called cannabis, not marijuana. Marijuana was a slang term, a Mexican slang term that was derogatory to the elite of Mexico. At the time, as bad as the N-word to African Americans. Well, we're going to call it marijuana, so people don't know we're going to make their medicine illegal. So Harry Onslinger got articles put in Randolph Hearst newspapers across this country that were all lies. And one of the easy ways to turn people against cannabis is we're going to make it a racial issue. Because everybody knows all them black musicians are smoking dope. So big headlines. Imagine this. On the front page of the newspaper in every major city, marijuana makes white women crave black men. Holy cow! They also produced a movie at that time. How many of you remember the movie? What's the name of it? Reefer Madness, where a white man smoked a joint and took an axe and killed his family. Man, oh man, this stuff, this marijuana really is bad. They bribed a committee of Congress with lots of money, and it came up for debate in Congress. Stop me if you've heard this before. They slid about, I think it was four pages on the new law into a 250-page bill that was before Congress, and nobody read it. Have you heard a story like that recently? One man in Congress read it, Sam Rayburn, who happened to have been the Speaker of the House from Texas. He said, what, what, what's this in here uh, about this dangerous drug you want to make illegal, marijuana? Boom, one of the bribed members of the Congressional Committee stood up and said, oh, it's evil. It has no medical value. It's a gateway drug. It leads to more serious offenses. We've got to make it illegal in this country. And Sam Rayburn said, this is all on record now. Obtained through the, uh, what's it called, Privacy or Freedom of Information Act. Sam Rayburn says, uh, well, uh, what does, did you... Interview the AMA. Oh, yes. Another bribe member of the Congressional Committee stood up and said, the AMA said, we have got to make it unlawful. It's a dangerous narcotic. When in fact, they did take testimony from Dr. Woodward, who was the medical director for the AMA, and he said, do not make this illegal. It's a miracle medicine used to treat over a hundred illnesses. Boom. Nearly unanimously, they passed the marijuana tax that made it illegal in our country. 
And that doggone Harry Onslinger kept getting articles published in Randolph Hearst newspapers for years. And Harry Onslinger, doggone it, he refused to die. He was director of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics till 1963, the year I graduated from high school. Then you had about four years in there until 1968 in this country. The old farts like me, you remember 1968, we had race riots all over this country. We had anti-war demonstrations. My undergraduate degree was at Kent State University where four students were killed during anti-war demonstrations. And Nixon said, we've, we've got to stop these hippies from rioting and being against the war, we've got to stop the blacks. And his two henchmen said, we know how to stop them. Well, how do we stop them? Well, we put them in jail. So they passed something called the CSA, Controlled Substances Act. And they put marijuana right up there as schedule one, along with heroin above cocaine, above meth, and made it as serious of an offense as heroin, and started arresting blacks and hippies countrywide. That's our country's history with this miracle medicine called cannabis. And I was totally against it didn't bother me at all when somebody stood in front of me in my courtroom. You have anything to say before I impose sentence? Oh, some other dude did it. Heard that about a thousand times. One year, 30 days, 90 days. Now let's go forward. Met my beautiful wife sitting right over here. We got married. I was teaching contractors in the state of Florida their continuing education. Been doing that for 23 years. I retired as a practicing attorney very young, very lucky. In the spring of uh, 2015, um, I was admitted to the hospital with pneumonia. I had been having trouble with asthma and allergies and pneumonia for a long time. Got released from the hospital and they didn't really know what was causing me to be sick. And I went to another doctor, a specialist who did blood work, a PET scan, an MRI, you name it, he did it. My wife was with me that day. He comes back into his office after about an hour of tests and says words you don't ever want to hear. He says, Doug, is your wife with you today? You don't ever want to hear that from your doctor. Uh, yes, sir, she's out in the waiting room. I think she's doing emails or something on her computer. Well, you may want to have her come in. Uh-oh. So my wife came in. I was already mad at him because on his wall there was a picture of the national championship football game where the Gators beat my Buckeyes <laughs> in the championship game. But he says, Doug, you have COPD. You have emphysema. You have chronic bronchitis. 
Doc, I, I know about bronchitis, I know about allergies, I know about asthma, but what's this COPD? Is, is that that disease where that commercial is the elephant sits on the guy's chest? He says, yes, that chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Oh, Doug, there's no cure. And at your stage, it's probably going to take your life unless something else gets you first. What do you mean, take my life? Well, there's no cure. How long have I got, Doc? Oh, well, we don't. Uh, shut up, Doc. How long have I got? Well, I can tell you the. The average at your stage is about 20 months. But that's just an average. Could be a lot longer, could be less, but we can give you some medications that will make you more comfortable. I got to tell you, I was a wimp. I started crying. My wife, God bless that woman, got angry. We're leaving his office, he pulls her back aside and says, you need to get his affairs in order now. Made her even matter. Any of you have wives that are into essential oils? I used to get so damn mad at my wife because she spent all this money on them little brown bottles of essential oils that didn't do nothing. <laughs> Hundreds of them we had at our house. Where the crap did you get this money? Well, from, from you. <laughs> well, I got to tell you, my wife's interest in essential oils saved my life. Because I went home, plopped down on the couch. We, we have a little horse farm in Florida, horses. And I sat on the couch watching the horses in the pasture, feeling sorry for myself, waiting to die. My wife was at the other end of the house where her computer was. And we had a a little breakfast area where we had some supplies and there were empty notebooks in there that I would use when I would teach the contractors or continuing education, they'd get a notebook. And about every third day, my wife would come in there and get another empty three ring notebook and take it back to her office, the other end of the house. I didn't know what she was doing. What she was doing is she went on, she was mad as a hornet. She went on the internet looking for an essential oil that would help me. I'm not going to let my husband die. I'm going to find an essential oil that'll save him. Folks, she found the quintessential essential oil. It's called cannabis. But her husband was a prohibitionist. How many of you know or were or are a prohibitionist? You're against the use of cannabis. You're all lying to me. You all know somebody like me. So while I'm sitting there waiting to die, I notice that my wife gets notebook after notebook after notebook of research studies upon cannabis as a medicine. But she can't say anything to me because I was totally opposed to it. So she did the only honorable thing. She lied to me. We had a ranch out in Colorado as well as our home in Florida. And my wife said to me, this was in September. She started her research in April of 2015, and in September she said, honey, there's a horse conference out at uh, Esses Park, so I'm going to go out to the ranch and uh, go to that uh, conference. 
okay. She and one of her good friends went to Colorado, but she wasn't going to Colorado for a horse conference. You see, cannabis was not lawful in Florida in 2015. It was in Colorado. So she went to Colorado, went to a dispensary in Boulder, Colorado. Did you go to more than one or did you just go to one? And this woman back here in the green committed felonies. <laughs> she bought some syringes of cannabis oil, put it in her checked bag. How many did you buy? In Florida, each gram in 2015 would have been five to 10 years in prison. And she comes back to Florida with these syringes of cannabis oil, very thick oil. Got up the courage and said to me, honey, I, I want you to take some of this. Now she had created a, an essential oil before that that we would rub on my chest and my back at night. Uh, it sounded like a recipe for lasagna to me. <laughs> It had oil of oregano and eucalyptus and all kinds of stuff. It helped me breathe a little better at night. But if you are late stage COPD, you're wheezing all the time. And, and uh, it was very, very difficult for me to breathe at night, especially. And uh, my poor wife, it, it kept, I kept waking her up. My voice, my breathing would crackle and wheeze during the night. She bought a air purifier, put it by the bed, turn it on high to drown out my breathing. So she comes up to me and says, honey, I, I want you to try some of this. What is it? Doesn't matter what it is, Doug, doesn't matter. I, I just want you to try it. I've been doing a lot of research and I think it might help with your COPD. What is it, Jan? Well, essentially, it's an essential oil. <laughs> Give me that damn thing. Oh, my God, that's marijuana. <laughs> what the hell are you? Did you go to Colorado and get this stuff? Yes. then you take it and get the hell out of my house. That's against the law. What the hell are you thinking? That argument went on for six days. Stupid. Brainwashed. It's evil. Day seven, my wife did the most phenomenal thing. Well, for six days she prayed to our Lord for me to get some damn wisdom. And day seven, we had a spiral staircase at our house. Here she comes. I'm sitting in the, on the couch feeling sorry for myself. Here she comes down the stairs with a suitcase. Jan, what are you doing? I'm leaving your sorry butt. What? I'm leaving you. You won't help yourself. I'm not going to help you either. I'm going to live with Molly and the kids in Orlando. No, you don't mean that. And then it happened. She dropped for the first time in 12 years, the F-bomb. <laughs> the F-I'm-not! Whoa! How many of you know when your wife drops the F-bomb, you're in deep trouble? <laughs> I, I don't want you to leave. I need you. 
then take this or I'm gone. How do, how do I take it? Well, you can put a tiny little drop under your tongue. That's called sublingual. I don't care what it's called. Or you can put it in this capsule and put it in your, I'll put it under my tongue. <laughs> but I won't, am I going to get high? I don't think so, she says. High content CBD, you don't get high. Well, I, I, I don't know what's going to happen. I, I'm only going to do it at, at night. So that night, sitting on the edge of the bed, she squeezes out the tiniest little pinhead sized drop of this oil. And I put it under my tongue. Oh, this, this tastes like shit. <laughs> Shut up. So I, I'm there in bed. Keep in mind, I'd never touched this stuff. Never. Thought it was evil. For all I knew, my arm was going to fall off if I, if, I, if I swallowed that stuff. So I'm sitting there. And all of a sudden, I noticed my wife standing here by the bed. I said, honey, am I, am I being silly? Am I giggling? Am I saying stupid stuff? <laughs> she says, Doug, it's 8.30 in the morning. You just slept for eight hours for the first time in two years. Wow. What? Okay, maybe I'll do another drop tonight. <laughs> That was October the 6th of 2015. Each night, and she had done a research, she had done four or five months of research. If you hear people tell you there's no research on cannabis, they're full of crap. They need to be educated, folks. That's your job, that's my job. Education. There are 20 some thousand studies on the medical benefits of cannabis for over 70 illnesses, including 40 some different cancers. So we took a drop each night, just tiny little drop. After a week or so, she increased it. Uh, but to this day, I still take a drop of uh, CBD and THC cannabis oil uh, never larger than a grain of rice. About two weeks or so, wasn't it, honey, when the wheezing started to subside? Just a couple weeks. Crackling was first. The crackling in my voice as I breathed was disappearing after about seven to ten days. And then the wheezing stopped. By mid-November, the wheezing was pretty much gone. I was still weak, very, very weak. Uh, it, it was funny. We, my wife and I had taken in rescue dogs, and that big spiral staircase, we allowed all our dogs to sleep with us. And uh, at that time, we had five or six dogs, all different breeds that nobody wanted but us. And we'd always take them out, before bedtime, you know, and then they'd run up the stairs with you to get the good spot on the bed. But when I got really sick with COPD, I couldn't walk up more than two or three stairs without stopping. And it was funny because the dogs would stop with me and wait for me to go up the stairs. You know, something as simple as walking up a flight of stairs when you have a serious terminal disease, or allegedly terminal disease, 
and you can walk upstairs again, it's a wonderful thing. February came around, and I told my, I was feeling pretty good. I was getting my strength back. I could walk up the steps without stopping. And I told my wife, I want to go back to that doctor, the one who said I was going to die. And I want him to do all the same tests again. So we go back to my pulmonologist and we do all the same tests. And he comes back into the office with a perplexed look on his face. And he says, Doug, I, I don't know what's happening here, but your symptoms are gone. I can't even find any scar tissue in your lungs. And as he walks over to shut his door, he says to me, Doug, what are you doing? Doc, I'm committing a felony on a daily basis and I ain't stopping. (laughs) Oh, you mean you're using marijuana? No, sir, I'm using cannabis sativa. It's a medicine. Oh, well, I can't put that in your chart. Why not? Well, I could lose my license if I put that in your chart that you were cured by an illegal drug. So he put in my chart that I was asymptomatic for unknown reasons. Folks, you're going to run into people like that. I was one of them. 20 months from the day he told us was up in December of 2016. So we're almost three years past when I was supposed to be dead. And there's two reasons, actually three. One is the Lord, two is cannabis, and three is the miracle called my wife. Jan, stand up a second, please. That brat wouldn't take no for an answer. But I gotta tell you the rest of the story because you're here for a reason today. One of the things you heard Tom say earlier, we are an education company. Folks, I'm challenging you to educate people about this miracle that God created that because of greed and corruption we thought was horrible. I challenge each of you to just educate one person a month for the next year about the benefits the true benefits of cannabis. When the doctor said I was asymptomatic, I went back to teaching my continuing education classes to Florida home builders. They got to take 14 hours every two years. And I was, still am, licensed by the state of Florida to teach that. And I said to my wife, honey, I've got to share this information with the home builders. It's my only audience. I see four to 5,000 of those guys a year. I've got to tell them. It might save just one life to educate these people about the medical benefits of cannabis. She said, no, 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 you can't. You might piss somebody off and lose your license with the state. So you can't. But honey, we've got to. So we prayed on it. We went and met with our pastor about it. And I said, I gotta do it. Interesting, it was on April Fool's Day. 
April 1st, 2016, I told the first class. I was diagnosed with a terminal disease. My wife discovered that cannabis could treat that disease, even though modern medicine said it was incurable, and I've now been cured. Right there in that very first class, two or three people started emailing my wife on their computer while I was talking, saying, listen, Doug's telling his story in class. Can you help my wife? She has COPD, or can you help my husband? He has renal cell cancer. Can... And we had to tell all of them, no, no, it's illegal. It's illegal. And we did that for about three months. Every class told them, no, we can't help you. You, you, you know, you find out on your own. Have you, have you got a friend in Colorado? <laughs> then it happened. Young contractor, big tall guy, about six foot four. I don't see Mike in the room, my favorite DEA guy. Big guy comes up to me after I tell my story, a tear running down his cheek. Doug, can you please help? And immediately I start saying, no, we can't. And he said, our daughter, Ellie, five years old. She has intractable epilepsy. She has 20 to 25 seizures a day, any one of which could take her life. Doug, please, please, please. We've heard cannabis could help. CBD could help. Shit. Okay, we'll help you. That was the first one. So her parents went with us to Colorado. We introduced them to a friend of ours in Colorado that's an expert on cannabis, a doctor. Rav Ivker is his name. He has a clinic in Boulder called uh, Fully Alive. Introduced them to a friend of ours that owns a dispensary in Denver that is extremely knowledgeable. And everybody that my wife and I have met in the cannabis industry, have, everybody has a story like mine. You know, that David, who we introduced him to, who had several patients who had treated epilepsy, lost his mother to cancer before he knew that cannabis may have saved her life. Dr. Ifker had shingles and discovered he could treat and stop the shingles with CBD. Everybody we met had a story. So Ellie's parents come back from Colorado, violating the law. My wife showed them how. <laughs> Their daughter's now eight and a half years old and off of the four narcotics they had her on that didn't help her seizures whatsoever, and she now has one mild seizure every three months. <laughs> that was the beginning. So we started having seminars around the state of Florida to educate the contractors, because that was my only audience, the only people I knew. And uh, they're a tough crowd, home builders. You know, I get up in front of them in a seminar, and they're all sitting there like this. I ain't going to listen to your crap. This is all crap. It's evil. It's a dangerous drug. It's a gateway drug. And by the time the seminar is over and they learn the truth, they're ordering CBD from us. I want to talk briefly about prohibitionists like me. Folks, 
each of us in this room know better than what we were taught for 70, 80 years in this country. And I charge you with the responsibility of educating the people like me, the prohibitionists. Because folks, I was absolutely blessed. I had a wife that wouldn't put up with my crap and was adamant. You got to take this medicine. But if you're not that adamant with a prohibitionist, you know what's going to happen to them? They're going to die. If they have a cancer, if they have a kidney failure, if they have uh, eczema, unless you convert them and educate them from being a prohibitionist, their life is going to be cut short because of what we were told because of the greed and corruption that still exists. Florida, in November of 2016, it was on the ballot in Florida. It was on the ballot in 2014 and voted down. But in 2016, after myself and several other people went around the state talking at every Rotary Club and Lions Club and Kiwanis Club and anybody who would listen about the medical benefits of cannabis, it passed in Florida with the highest passing percentage of any constitutional amendment in any state in the country, 71%. And of course, we're jumping for joy when in reality, the politicians in Florida and many other states are getting fed money into their pockets by those who oppose the legalization of this miracle medicine. From big pharma to alcohol companies to grocery store chains in Florida, uh, Public Supermarkets, which is a big grocery store chain in Florida, they donated $1.8 million to fight the legalization of cannabis. Why? Because they have pharmacies in every one of their grocery stores. And in Colorado, when cannabis was made lawful in 2014, opiate narcotic prescription sales went down 32%. I understand it. I don't agree with it. Private prisons oppose legalization of cannabis because they get paid by the inmate. And boy, we got a lot of inmates in prison for marijuana offenses, don't we? So we've got a huge responsibility to educate, educate, and if I think about it, educate people about the marvelous medical benefits of cannabis. I, my wife, she's the expert. You know, they, they call me, they email me, Doug, please help. Well, what's wrong? Well, I've got gazorntatitis, you know, some disease I've never heard of. And okay, I'll have you talk to my wife, and my wife will tell them what strain of CBD and THC can help them. She's amazing. She saved dozens and dozens of lives to this point. And, uh, we go around now speaking everywhere people will listen uh, to educate people about the marvelous benefits of this. And you have the duty to do the same. And I just want to, in closing, tell you about, I want to take you back about 15 years again. My mother, who was a, a genius, wonderful woman. My father was pro football player. Where's Dot? My father played football for a real professional football team, not the Raiders. <laughs> 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 
My father played for Cleveland Browns back when there was a team in Cleveland. <laughs> and uh, he was killed, unfortunately, in an auto accident when I was just 13. He had become a minister. He went from professional football to the ministry, felt a strong calling, and he was a wonderful man, but me and my brother and sister were raised by our mom after we lost him, and she was a wonderful woman. And she was a member of Mensa. You all know what Mensa is? Uh, the people with extremely high IQs. Uh, unfortunately, it skips a generation. <laughs> but my mom, imagine this, a, a member of Mensa developed dementia. And we watched her slowly fade away. Today we know, through some research done at the Jonas Salk Institute down in La Jolla, whichever is south from here, that cannabis can stop the buildup of plaque in the brain caused by Alzheimer's dementia. We didn't know that 15 years ago. But when mom passed from Alzheimer's, scared the bejeebers out of me. I was in my early 60s, holy crap. If it can take my genius mother, what the heck chance do I have? So I started reading everything I could get my hands on about the human brain. And I, my, my oldest grandson, who was just six when I started reading, we had this little game where I would call him each week with how many pages of brain research I had read, and his job was to add that to my total. A little math problem for my six-year-old at the time, grandson. And it, it got over 100,000 pages of brain research because what the scientist discovered in the last 15 years about the human brain is outstandingly amazing. And it's because they developed this new brain imaging equipment that could see things in the human brain we could never see before. Uh, one such device was called a SPECT, S-P-E-C-T, scanner, that could see a slice of the human brain one ten thousandth the thickness of a sheet of paper. So they were seeing things that had never been observed before in a living, breathing, functioning brain, not dead brain tissue after somebody died under a microscope. You with me? So it led to phenomenal discoveries about how you can improve the performance of your brain. One of the leading scientists is a guy named Richard Restick. R-E-S-T-A-K, write that down. Restick, R-E-S-T-A-K, first name Richard. MD, neuroscientist. I've got one of his books here called The New Brain. I'm gonna destroy every excuse you ever had for achieving based on brain science. Oh, Doug, I can't educate people. I'm not smart enough to educate. Oh, yes, you are. Because what the scientists have learned is that if you learn how your brain works, sweetheart, I ran up here when Raul called me to go backstage before I grabbed my glasses. Could you bring <laughs> Everybody give Jan Bench a hand. Listen to this. In the era of the new brain, the emphasis in the research is shifting from disease and dysfunction to an understanding of the brains of the average man and woman. That's me and you guys. 
An exciting consequence follows from this new emphasis on the normal brain. Research can now provide us with useful guidelines about our everyday lives. For instance, recent findings indicate, here it comes, listen, that by following certain brain-based guidelines, anyone, anyone can achieve expert performance in sports, academics, athletics, or other pursuits. Such findings, of course, run contra to the traditional theory that achievers and geniuses are born and not made. That our genes and other factors outside of our control impose limits on our individual capabilities. This is not so. Indeed, it's now clear that by learning about and applying new brain research discoveries, all of us can reasonably expect to greatly enhance our personal levels of achievement. Learn about how your brain works and you can achieve anything. Oh, it pissed me off because it takes away all your excuses. Doesn't it? Everybody grab your pen. I've studied the human brain for 16 years. I had, like my wife did with research on cannabis, I did research on the human brain. And I had like 1,700 pages of my notes that I took on those books. And a very good friend of mine says, Doug, you need to turn that into a book. It might help people achieve more. It might help people educate others about the medicinal benefits of this miracle plant. If you send me an email, I will sell, send you for free digital copies of my two best-selling books on how to make your brain achieve more. Would you like that? Yes. Doug, D-O-U-G, at rethinkgreen.org. Rethinkgreen.org. Doug, D-O-U-G. If you send me an email, say, Doug, I saw you in Sacramento. I'd love to have your books. The first one is called Revolutionize Your Brain. Kiss Your Old Brain Goodbye. And the second one, which was made bestseller list, was Do-It-Yourself Brain Surgery. <laughs> but they both will show you how you can achieve at a higher level, not from me, but from the scientists that we've read over the years. And you can take that information and apply it in your relationship with Club Nirvana and educate the masses of this country to the marvelous benefits of cannabis. I really appreciate you all listening understand where I came from and where we are now. And everyone in this room can help us educate everyone to this miracle medicine. You may wonder why I'm sitting down when well, I'm diabetic and had horrific neuropathy from the hip joints all the way to the bottom of my feet. Since I've been on cannabis, the neuropathy in the upper legs are t is totally gone. The neuropathy in my lower legs is gone down to the ankles, but I still have it in the bottom of my feet, which means I can't feel very well. But about another six months taking that little drop under the tongue every night, and that'll be gone too. But it, it keeps me from maintaining balance standing up very well. That's why I sat. However, I am an egomaniac, and the rule is, when the judge stands, everybody stands. <laughs> Thank you all.
Thank <laughs> you.